God says the Jew requires a sign, a miracle, in order to believe in Jesus. But this skeptical Jewish pediatrician was in a state of shock when God gave him a miracle sign that had no scientific explanation. Next. Welcome, Holy Spirit. I know you're here, and I pray that you be so free that everything you want done in this show will happen. Dr. Neil Goodman grew up in a traditional conservative Jewish family. Neil, tell us about your childhood. Absolutely, Sid. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I grew up from middle class folks. My mom was an artist. My dad was a salesman. And we had a traditional Jewish family, and we would celebrate the high holidays together. I went through a bar mitzvah uh, when I was 13. I went to Sunday school. And I lived in a community where there were both Jewish kids and Gentile kids. And one of my favorite friends who lived across the street was a Catholic. And I used to go to his house, and we would celebrate Christmas at his house because I didn't have a Christmas tree. And he had in his um, um, foyer a picture of Jesus Christ. And I was always curious about Jesus. I could look into his eyes, and I just felt I wanted to know more about him. Hmm. But I asked my parents, I said, can you tell me about Jesus? And they said, oh, honey, we don't really talk about Jesus. You know, he's, he's a prophet, and that was really it. I really wasn't allowed in my family to question that. But my father took ill at about when I was age, I would say 15 or 16 years old. He was a really heavy smoker, and he came down with cancer. My father was a heavy smoker, and he came down with cancer. Yeah, I mean, smoking is such a bad habit. I grew to hate smoking. And we would tell him, I, was, I had brothers and sisters, and we would tell him not to please smoke, but he persisted, and the house was always filled with fumes. And that was something we all suffered with. Um, well, as it turned out, when I was 16, he came down with lung cancer. Hmm. And as a consequence of that, my, my, he couldn't work his job, and my mother um, was a street artist, as I said. She was a very artistic, and she always encouraged us to be artistic and creative. But I was um, challenged with taking him to his chemotherapy treatments. And when I did that, I noticed that the doctors that were taking care of him, I, it was like almost like I didn't exist. They just sort of saw right through me. Um, there wasn't really much compassion, much emotion in treating him as a cancer patient. And I knew at that moment, I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to do better than what was done to me in my desire to try to help people. And, and so ultimately, I sort of charged myself with trying to learn everything that I could possibly learn in order to become the best doctor that I could. So that, you might say the compassion and what you observed with your father, uh, who died, unfortunately, uh, uh, was the seed for you to become a medical doctor. Absolutely, absolutely. And the love of knowledge. I really, really wanted not only to help humanity, but to help people. And that love of, of knowledge and um, um, exploration. So I went ahead and uh, went to medical school. I graduated college, went to medical school, and I met my lovely wife, Peggy, in medical school. And, uh, and my, my wife was a Catholic. And as a Catholic, um, there was a little bit of a challenge for my mother, who was the only remaining member of my family other than my father's side. Um, to was, was there any difficulty with your family when you married a non-Jew? Um, not after we committed to marriage, but in the preparation before marriage, there was a lot of um, uh, disappointment, I would say, t for me to marry outside of my faith. Yeah, I had the same thing. Yeah. But, my, but curiously, in, uh, my mother, after my father's passing, uh, within two years of my father's passing, she actually married outside of the faith and married a Methodist man. So she had already introduced the idea that um, a Jewish woman, I guess, in my family could go outside of our faith. Uh, but I will say that my mother wasn't really a practicing Jew, and this gentleman who was a Methodist wasn't really deeply involved in his faith either. 
So it was just a, a title that he was Methodist. Now, you two got married right after you graduated medical school. Uh, and tell me about how you got married. Right. Well, it's a, we, we couldn't um, have a rabbi uh, marry us, so we actually enlisted a Jesuit Catholic priest from the local university. And we asked him, could you perform a Jewish ceremony for both of us? We'll say the brachas in Hebrew with the chuppah and all the... Uh, that's uh, the blessings, and the chuppah is, is a covering that Jewish people use. Uh, uh, when they get married. Right, Go the ahead. ceremonial canopy, right? right, with the breaking of the wine glass and everything. We did our prayers and vows to each other in Hebrew. My wife learned Hebrew mm -hmm. to, for the purpose of that, that marriage. And this Jesuit priest was absolutely elated with having the opportunity to perform his first Jewish wedding. And it was in a Catholic church, so I had my Catholic friends, my wife's mm -hmm. side of the family, and my side of the family. And you have to understand that Jews would never step into a Catholic church. It's just something we don't do. And yet they were there, and they participated, and it really soothed both sides. Tell you what, God is so good. He gave Dr. Goodman an undeniable miracle that caused him to sell out to God's kingdom. This miracle story triggers miracles. Why? Because the same miracle presence of God that transformed Dr. Goodman will pour out of your screen. Be right back. We will be right back to It's Supernatural. I feel like this is history repeating itself. Passport. Isn't that much like the mark that the Jews were forced to wear to show that they either belonged in society or not belonged in society? It was a way of segregating people. So I, I feel that this is a modern day Holocaust. I really do. So I've been practicing medicine now for 38 years. And at the time of COVID, a new mandate had come about. And I couldn't understand for the life of me why the pressure and so insistent about it. I knew there was something intrinsically wrong. And so when I challenged the authorities of the hospital, I was brought into a quiet room where nobody can hear you yell if you decide that you're gonna act up. They told me that they were exercising their termination clause immediately. And I was devastated. All I knew is I stood for my ground. I stood for the children. I knew in my heart, and God told me, you will have blood on your hands, and I just couldn't go there. I couldn't do it, because for me, that was a, a loss of everything that I stood for. In my service of children, to protect them, what I swore to do. So I was at the lowest point in my life. We now return to It's Supernatural. Uh, Dr. Goodman, I mean, talk about God. Dr. Goodman just happened to be my neighbor. And he just happened to read my testimony book. Uh, what effect did it have on you, and what happened next? Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, Sid, it literally, I mean, here I am, a Jewish man, married to a Catholic woman, and I wanted to uh, enjoy the sacraments of the Catholic Church. I wanted to participate in communion with her, and I wasn't able to, and I had a lot of guilt over being Jewish and then um, doing that. It was meant giving up something. And what I read from your teaching, from your book, and I didn't even know you were my neighbor, uh, but what I got from the teaching was is that I wasn't giving up any of my being Jewish in order to follow and become a believer in the Messiah. I mean, I could have him too, and I could believe in him, and I wasn't mu less of a Jew. So it really gave me permission in order to pursue my um, accepting the Holy Spirit as Jesus the Messiah into my life. And I didn't have that at that point. So I initiated the process of uh, conversion in the Catholic Church. I wanted to participate in that. Um, however, 
there was a Seder that occurred uh, in the community, and I had a really good singing voice as a child. And in fact, I even thought about going to cantorial school as a Jew. I was bar mitzvahed and everything, but um, in the Seder, I sang the brachas. And at that Seder, I was given an invite to go to a revival. And that revival you were teaching, and I had no idea what a revival was. What is, I'm wondering what a, a Jewish person thinks when they hear the word revival. Did uh, it have uh, any meaning? I, in I, it? I, 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 to me, I guess it meant renewal or bringing something new, but I didn't have what it was that I needed to renew in the first place. I didn't <laughs> understand it. <laughs> So I go unsuspecting to this revival in a, in a church, and as I know it now, a Pentecostal church, which was probably the extreme, right? And what you didn't know is we were going through a genuine move of God's Spirit at the time, and the Holy Spirit was coming on everyone in those services. Go ahead. And this is 25 years ago, Sid, when we had our first right. encounter. So this is sort of a reuniting for you and I. Right. But 25 years ago, I walk into this, uh, this revival, and I'm seeing all kinds of crazy stuff. I mean, <laughs> a Jewish man walking into a foreign church, and there are people that are falling down, and there are people that are talking in tongues. There are people that are waving flags and laying on the ground with uh, pink scarves on their face. And I'm just completely, <laughs> I'm wondering if I really even need to be here. I thought for a half a moment about leaving, to be honest. I mean, I was scared. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, my wife wasn't accompanying me. I don't think she wanted any part of it. But <laughs> so, so they started blowing the shofar. And you know, the shofar is familiar to me. I mean, really, it sort of shifts takes the rafters of the congregation. And everyone, there were a number of people blowing the shofar and people calling Yeshua, Jesus from the rafters. I mean, the room was shaking and I started to sweat. And, and, I, and I mean, I was really nervous. And, and quite frankly, I was really scared. And then there was an altar call. And I, honestly, I didn't know what it was an altar call at that time, but you had called people down to the front of the, of the, of the congregation and said, those that wanted to come and accept Jesus into their life at this moment, please come down if you feel compelled. And I did. This was my moment because I had been searching for Christ all throughout my childhood. And here I was now in this congregation and you had given me permission to come forward and I did. And so I, at that moment, I accepted Christ into my life and, I mean, the emotion overcame me. This is 25 years ago. 25 but years ago, I feel right it. Now. I feel it just at this moment. And I walked back to my seat, and I didn't know what happened to me because I was so upset. I knew something had happened. I was hot. I was sweating. And I looked down at my hands. And in my hands, in my lifelines, the creases, there was liquid gold that was coming from my pores in my hands. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic, a scientist. You have to prove things to me. I don't believe this. This is unbelievable. I, I looked at the Bibles that I was holding. They, they didn't have gold on the surface. They had no gold or writing on it. Where did this come from? And, and I wiped it away with my hand, and it kept reforming. And it was in both hands. And I'm looking at it, and as I'm watching it, it's pooling. It's about the size of a dime in the, in the center of my palm. And I wipe it away, and it recreates itself. Well, I got to tell you, I, I knew instantly in my heart what it represented. And I looked at the back of my hands because I, I didn't know what had happened to my body. And, and, and there wasn't a mark on the back of my hands. But this, this dot of liquid gold, this like mercury that flew, f flowed from my, my skin. As I went back to my seat, my people that were next to me didn't have this. So I went home, I showed my wife, and by this time it had dissipated, but now in the place of where the liquid gold was, was a blister. And this blister peeled off, and underneath it was raw skin. And I have these two divots in my hand with raw, painful skin. I had to look down at my ankles. <laughs> I mean, I, was, I looked for a mark, and, and there wasn't one. But I called you up the next day and I said, Sid, I need to meet with you. And then we went and you said, come on, there's only one Chinese restaurant in Brunswick, Georgia. And I don't know if you know this, but you, you know it. But Jews love Chinese food. We just do. 
I, I, didn't have to a- I didn't have to ask him if he liked Chinese food. I just went. Yeah, that, that's my acid <laughs> test to find out if someone's Jewish. <laughs> and, and so I went there, and you took my hand, and you reached across the table, took my hand, and you said, Neil, you've been anointed. And I looked at him, I looked at you, and I said, anointed, what do you mean? I mean, what does that mean? I don't understand this. He said, you've been anointed by God, and you've been given a gift, and you need to use that gift in your healing of children that you do every day. And I just like, oh my God, how could this be? Why am I even deserving of this? I was just really in shock, and I, and I mentioned what it meant to my wife when I went home. But that mantle of responsibility, I mean, I couldn't even comprehend how I was going to do that. How can I have time in my office to pray over children? That doesn't happen in corporate medicine. You don't have the time to do that. And then what happened is the pandemic happened 25 years later, just two years ago. And in that pandemic situation, I was forced to make a decision about treating children with a agent that I disagreed with. The the mandate was is that I would be giving this agent to children, unsuspecting children potentially, without cause, they don't need it, from ages down all the way to five months. And I had a problem with that. And I stood my ground and I said, I can't do this. In moral conscience, I cannot do this. And so I stood my ground. And the next day, the leaders of the institution that I worked for took me aside and put me in a quiet room. And they brought in the head of HR. And they said, we're going to exercise our termination clause on you. I said, what? After 37 years of treating children, I have 10,000 children that I'm responsible for of all different ages and, and different, you know, handicapped and premature babies and infants that I've saved through the years. And now you're ending me unceremoniously because I wouldn't give something that I, I felt that morally I, I, it was er, er, incomprehensible for me to do. And so I went home. I was devastated. Emotionally devastated, I was at my lowest point. I literally had lost my career. They had called the authorities in on me as a spreader of misinformation in order to end my career, essentially cutting off my livelihood. And then I watched a show on TV, and the show was The Chosen. Mm -hmm. It was the first episode, first season. And I mean, I really was just devastated. And in that show, Jesus walks to Mary Magdalene, and he says to her, I have called you by name, and you are mine. And I, and I knew that I was chosen, that I had an appointment, I had an, a, an assignment by God that I was standing in my right in order to protect children which is what I had sworn my whole life to. I had a life of servitude, of, of, of treating children and treating families. And, and, I, and I couldn't possibly forsake them by being a complicit in potentially their demise, is what I, I saw. And God told me at that moment that I did right. And I felt it. I knew he was speaking to me in the TV show. Me, the Jew, the skeptic. And you know, it was just like the Jews in Israel. They were in bondage for 20 years, for 40 years, and then exiled. And I was in Exodus. I was essentially exes, ex, in Exodus from my office, from my practice, from my, my vocation. And I realized at that moment I had been in bondage for 25 years or more because I've been practicing under the rule of Pharisees. And now, finally, came into my anointing that I received 25 years earlier as I accepted Christ into my life at that moment, finally came to fruition 25 years later, where I could finally have a greater impact of healing on children. And that's what I've been doing ever since. That's so wonderful. Very quickly, uh, here's a website that helps people that have had this particular treatment that have side effects, long-term side effects, uh, or or may get it later. Uh, Just just, uh, where it mentions vitamins that'll build your immune system 
and really protect you in a lot of ways. Tell them your website. Okay, that website, Sid, is biohackerusa.com. That's B-I-O-H-A-C-K-E-R-U-S-A.com. And I talk about natural cures, natural building up of immunity, and things that can help to restore damage that has been done by many, many different elements. When he saw that episode of the, of, of, of the Chosen, he heard a line of scripture. That line caused him to, to weep. And this is what he heard. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 to 20 says, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make right now. It doesn't say right now, but I say that. The choice you make right now. Repeat this prayer after me. Stop being a Sunday Christian or a Jew that doesn't know Jesus or any religion that doesn't have personal intimacy with God that no man can ever talk you out of it. Repeat this prayer out loud with me, out loud. Dear God, I've made many mistakes for which I'm so sorry. I believe. The blood of Jesus washes away my mistakes, and I'm clean. And now that I'm clean, Jesus, I thank you for saving me from all of my sins. And I make you my Lord. Amen. Pray right now for healing right now. Father, I ask that you use my voice over the airwaves at this moment to reach those that don't know Jesus, to provide healing, salvation, to come into their hearts. Father, I ask that you open their eyes. Father, I ask that you allow them to hear. Father, I ask them that they are able to feel your spirit as I felt your spirit 25 years ago and then just two years ago to receive the anointing and the appointments that you assign. Allow us to fulfill your purpose. I ask all of these favors in your son's holy name, Jesus Christ, amen. One more thing, one more thing. Look in the camera and pray for the sick to be healed of any condition. Father, I recognize that in this world today, there are many evils, there are many dangerous things that have been let loose into society. And Father, I ask that those that have been affected, those that have been harmed, maimed, to realize that you have the ability to heal them if they will only accept you into their hearts, into their lives. I ask that you come through the camera right now, provide a blessing to those that have been affirmed, uh, it, it made sick, made ill, and restore them to complete and utter health as you originally created them, as they were made in your image when they were born. Amen. In Yeshua's name, so be it. I feel like this is history repeating itself. Passport. Isn't that much like the mark that the Jews were forced to wear to show that they either belonged in society or not belonged in society? It was a way of segregating people. So I, I feel that this is a modern day Holocaust. I really do. So I've been practicing medicine now for 38 years. And at the time of COVID, a new mandate had come about 
And I couldn't understand for the life of me why the pressure and so insistent about it. I knew there was something intrinsically wrong. And so when I challenged the authorities of the hospital, I was brought into a quiet room where nobody can hear you yell if you decide that you're gonna act up. They told me that they were exercising their termination clause immediately. And I was devastated. All I knew is I stood for my ground. I stood for the children. I knew in my heart and God told me, you will have blood on your hands. And I just couldn't go there. I couldn't do it. Because for me, that was a, a loss of everything that I stood for. In my service of children, to protect them, what I swore to do. So I was at the lowest point in my life.